and Veterans for Peace. Ah, thank you. Somebody just hit re record. Okay, good. Uh, so you are, it is being recorded. Uh, and that's uh, a bit of a, an, uh, so that you, you're aware of that, that if you're, if you're video showing, uh, the recording's also showing your, your video as well. So, uh, uh, so keep that in mind if you do any weird things with your hands or whatever. Um, so this meeting's being co-sponsored, as I said. Uh, it's focused on war and the environment. Um, and what I wanna do is share screen for just a second, because I wanna promote something here that um, is coming up with, uh, can folks see that? Um, this is a, I hope folks can see, can you see that war on the environment online course? Is, yes. Is that yes. showing? That's yeah, showing folks, scroll, okay. Scroll down a little bit for us. Yep. Is that? Are you seeing it? We just see the header of it. Okay, all right. Um, well, what I'll do, I'm gonna put the link uh, in the chat um, to uh, for that. Um, let me admit a couple more here. Uh, that's This is an upcoming a course that's uh, upcoming from uh, sponsored by World Beyond War. Uh, it's an online course, and I've taken several of these online courses from World Beyond War, and they are very good. And this one focuses very much on the topic that we're, we're discussing today. Uh, and so I highly recommend you uh, consider taking that course from World Beyond War. Um, if you have the time and, and so on. And I will now, how do I stop share? Just go up to the top, should be a red bar that says stop share near the top of your screen. There we go, thank you, Gary. <laughs> All right. Um, so with that, as I said, I'll, I'll copy that and put it in the chat. Um, and if you have, if folks have questions or comments, you can also put those questions in the chat. I think we're going to, I'll turn it over to Larry Gilbert here shortly, and then Gary will make the presentation. Um, I think we'd prefer that folks hold their questions, either put them in the chat, or when we get done with the presentation, you can use the raise hand feature uh, uh, to, uh, to ask a question and then we'll unmute you and so on. Um, and uh, otherwise we have everybody muted and we're gonna ask you to stay muted uh, until we uh, ask you to unmute. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Larry Gilbert, who's a, a friend of mine and, and a co-coordinator uh, co of our uh, Veterans for Peace chapter. Uh, Larry's by the way, uh, has a, tremendous background. He's former chief of police. He's an Air Force veteran. He's a former Army. mayor Army. of Lewiston. Army. Army? Yes. I thought you were Air Force. No. <laughs> okay. All right. Got drafted. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, sorry about, well, yeah. maybe sorry about that. Uh, and a former federal marshal. So, uh, so Larry has just a huge background and he is a strong advocate for peace and a very much a, an activist with the Veterans for Peace. So Larry, take it over. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, and it's uh, my uh, honor and, and pleasure to introduce Gary uh, Butterfield. And to tell you a bit about Gary, Gary was drafted into the U.S. Army uh, during the Vietnam War and then declared as a conscientious objector and opposed the war while in the military. He is resolute in acting on uh, his commitment to peace. He is past president of the San Diego chapter of Veterans for Peace and currently on the steering committee of the National Veterans for Peace Climate Crisis and Militarism Project. He is also a member of the San Diego 350.org. 
uh, I guess I'll ask him what that is, um, and is keenly interested in the effects of militarism uh, on the climate crisis. So um, also, uh, I'll, I'll put this in, uh, in the chat, um, the link to veteransforpeace.org, take action, climate crisis. So without uh, any further ado, I'll turn it over to Gary. And uh, so we're pleased to have you uh, here today, Gary. Thank you, Larry and Al. Thank you for inviting me and thank you all for taking time uh, from your schedules. I think most of you are in the East. Um, if you wanna drop your name and affiliation or where you're from into the chat so people can uh, get to know each other. That would be a great thing to do. Um, I'm going to set up the screen here. And um, as, as Larry said, uh, I'm a veteran from the Vietnam era and um, have been interested in peace and the environment for quite some time and, and have been involved at the local level and at the national level. And we have a six-year-old grandson now. And when I think about the state of the world and what we're gonna leave the next generations, I, I'm just convinced that we have to do better. And uh, one of the ways that I feel that I can contribute is, is to talk to people about the intersectionality of these two existential threats. And I think that coming from the perspective of a veteran, it gives us a certain perspective and credibility when we address this topic. And, and I find, and I am in San Diego 350.org, that's a national organization. I saw some smiles when, when Larry mentioned that, but it's a national organization devoted to taking better care of the environment than we're currently doing. Uh, most of them are independent organizations within their geographical area, and they have their hands full dealing with local issues, whether it be pollution from uh, some industrial site or uh, water issue or some other type of local issue. Many of them are very active, but they're committed to, to improving their local situation. And as I looked at the, the global situation, uh, when I start to talk about militarism to environmental people, I find that for a variety of reasons, they are undereducated, I would say, or ignorant of what the military's true contribution is. And I, and I think it's due to a, a couple of different reasons. And um, one is that we have an all volunteer military force now, and uh, there's a conscious effort on the part of those people who control things in this country to minimize what the military actually does and encourages us to go shopping. If we reflect back on the Iraqi war, they said the best thing you can do is go shopping. Well, in the meantime, uh, this behemoth has grown and I'd like to address how it affects all of us and how it interacts with the environment. So thank you again for, for being here. Now, recently, the United Nations held what was called the Conference of the Parties, which is uh, a meeting of most of the countries in the world to address the climate crisis. The last one was held five years ago in Paris. We heard of the situation called the Paris Accords that came out of it. Well, COP26 had a lot of expectations on it because of the accelerating pace of the climate crisis. Unfortunately, for most people and, and most observers who are interested in this, um, it was a disappointment. We did not see strong movement to curtail fossil fuels, emissions, and other types of pollution. There was no mention of military emissions in the 
actual official portion of COP26. There was very little substantive agreement among the countries, and there was no major commitment of funds for the richer nations to help ameliorate the situation in some of the lesser developed countries. However, there were a couple things that offered glimmers of hope. Uh, there was a, a China and US agreement to continue talking about solving the climate crisis. But more importantly, I think, as this picture signifies, there were gigantic social protests in the streets in Glasgow, primarily of younger people. And on uh, the Saturday of action, over 100,000 people marched in the streets. And uh, I see that as, as a good sign, a hopeful sign. So I like to look at this topic as really talking about the elephant in the room. And it's the military's devastating contribution to the climate crisis, not how the military is going to react and be impacted by climate change, but what the military actually contributes to the problem. But part of the situation is obscured because the government has willfully kept out of the public's view accurate information about the military's contribution to pollution. In fact, during one of the earlier climate conferences in Kyoto, there was something called the Kyoto Protocol on Climate Change in 1997. Well, ultimately, the United States never signed on to this agreement. However, the United States pressured all the other countries to exclude reporting of any military, of many military emissions to a country's contribution to total greenhouse gas emissions. However, we know, and NATO Secretary Stoltenberg said in a public remark in a conversation with U.S. Climate Envoy John Kerry, that climate change makes the world more unsafe. So NATO needs to step up and play a bigger role in combating it, including by reducing military emissions. However, that's not the position of the U.S. government. Well, one of the major motivators for us to develop this slideshow presentation was to help educate climate activists and other environmental groups about this situation. And I usually give them uh, a little background on Veterans for Peace. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with our group, we have over 140 chapters worldwide, um, about 105 chapters in the US, plus Vietnam, U the UK, Japan, and other countries in Europe, as well as Mexico. We are an educational 501c3 organization, and we have a codified statement of purpose, uh, which would be generally encompassed by talking about educating about the total costs of war, as well as relegating violence to be the last choice that humans employ when dealing with conflicts with each other. And to bring it closer to home about the intersectionality of climate damage in the military in, the military in this country, our executive director is quoted as saying, I don't wanna see my child struggling in a world filled with famine, natural disasters, climate refugees, and violence to meet scarce resource demands. He was a former US Army sniper in Iraq, and he now speaks out against unchecked militarism that contributes to massive climate destruction. Well, it's no secret that the climate crisis is accelerating. Uh, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, when commenting on the latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report just last August, declared that this is a code red for humanity. 
And uh, we've all heard through various news sources, the accelerating race of uh, rates of hurricanes, the severity of fires, floods, heat domes. This contributes to crop failures, famines and displacement. Sea level rise, I'm sure, is on the minds of many in Florida, um, as wildfires are here and heat domes are in the north north uh, west. On the left, we have a picture of a vulnerable family in Madagascar due to the famine that was caused by drought in a unprecedented worst ever cyclone, both of which were exacerbated by climate change. This left an estimated 600,000 people in need of emergency feeding. And of course, temperatures continue to rise. Within our group, we decided to look at four distinct areas of how this problem affects us. One is to actually look at the military boot print and, and what is that comprised of? We want to look at the wars that the politicians have gotten this country into, whether it be for oil, other extractive resources, and of course, for profit. We want to look at the overwhelming burden that both of these crises place on people of color, the poor, and future generations. And we want to look ultimately at how our tax dollars are being spent. How much money are we spending on militarism and war? And could that money be better put to use? Well, to state the obvious, <laughs> there is no such thing as a green war. And the effects of war in preparation for war are polluting and long lasting. Many of us, I'm, I, I'm sure, are from the Vietnam era. And, you know, there are still children there who are maimed by unexploded ordnance or born with severe birth defects from the transgenerational impacts of Agent Orange. We see a picture of burn pits, which seem to have arisen out of the Middle Eastern wars of the past 20 years. These are open air sites of solid waste incineration. They've been the subject of lawsuits by veterans and civilians alike. And recently, it doesn't seem to be a day that doesn't go by that I hear about PFAS. These are a group of man-made chemicals. They're known as forever chemicals, and they're, they're very prevalent in our society today. Uh, they're in Teflon-coated cooking ware, uh, many other products to give them um, impermeability to water, coatings even on dental floss. But primarily, we see them used as well in the firefighting foam that military bases employ to put out fires on their military bases. In fact, there are many military bases in surrounding areas that have to use bottled drinking water because of the high concentration of PFAS. And if you're not familiar with PFAS, you might Google that. Um, later on and see if there's something nearby that's contributing to PFAS contamination. And of course, anything connected with nuclear weapons carries a, a high load of pollution, whether it be uranium, uranium mining and processing, the production of weapons, uh, let alone if they're ever exploded again. Any war is climate destruction preparation for war is the same. And I do want to say uh, a word or two uh, about the subject that we call greenwashing by the military. Reducing the military's carbon boot trend is going to have to go much further than experimenting with solar panels on infantrymen's backpacks and experimental biodiesel as a fuel for naval vessels. We cannot allow the Pentagon to boost the military budget still further in the hollow pursuit of greening the military. 
we have to remember what the purpose and how the US military has been used. But let's look at the actual carbon bootprint of the military. It's actually much larger when you come to looking at greenhouse gases than that of many nations. This chart is from Brown University, which is a source that we use fairly frequently. And if you do go to our website, there's a page uh, that lists many of the resources and books that we have employed to back up the facts that we're providing you. But if the US military were a country, it would rank about number 47 among all the countries in the world in greenhouse gas emissions. And this is just from an estimate because we don't get accurate information. It's from an estimate of their fuel use. This is one institutional user. It's the largest institutional consumer of oil and emitter of CO2. One entity, one institutional user. Uh, I've got a couple of comparisons. Uh, the B-52, which has been around, I think, almost as long as Larry Gilbert, but uh, <laughs> it consumes about as much fuel as an, in an hour as the average car driver uses in seven years. We look at the Blue Angels or even the Air Force Thunderbirds. Uh, every hour that they fly, they're using over 9,000 gallons of highly polluting jet fuel each hour. Uh, that's the equivalent to a car being drive, driven over 145,000 miles in the equivalent amount of carbon dioxide that's produced. Oh, and as uh, an incidental fact, uh, sadly, 10% um, of these stunt pilots for the Blue Angels and Thunderbirds have died in aircraft crashes since their inception in 1953. So military jets is an easy one to look at. It's the largest consumer of fossil fuels in the military, but it goes way beyond that. The US supports over 750 bases internationally and maintains a fleet of vehicles that totals nearly 175,000. About 70,000 of those are Humvees, which typically get four to six miles per gallon. And really, at the end of the day, except for 80 submarines, nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers, the entire military fleet of vehicles runs on oil. And this is from Barry Sanders' excellent book, The Green Zone. It's a quick read. It's also uh, cited in our resources page. But not content to pollute the world, uh, we're looking beyond. The US is now militarizing space in a very, very heavy way. And that also carries a very heavy carbon load due to its numerous satellites, rockets, and ancillary equipment. Now, in Veterans for Peace, we don't have an issue with the troops. Most of us were troops at one time or another. We have issues with the policies that direct troops' activities. In addition to maintaining and supplying these overseas bases, the US routinely conducts major training exercises or war games that involve massive numbers of troops and equipment with its allies. Major commercial oil companies enjoy the protection of the US military in the Persian Gulf and other locations. And who pays for that? You know, the, the, the Pentagon doesn't present a bill to Exxon. That cost is borne by the U.S. taxpayers. And in fact, much of the money that's been spent fighting the global war on terror over the past 21 years has gone to military contractors. Those big five 
are probably household names because uh, the military likes to have production in almost every con congressional district. But the big five are Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Raytheon, General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman. And it's interesting that we see a revolving door of high ranking military personnel being appointed to the boards of directors on these five military contracting companies. And then they go back and forth. But let's not look over, not, let's not overlook the residual pollution that any war in preparation for war leaves. Within the United States, there's over 900 current or former US military installations that are classified as EPA Superfund sites. And of course, Superfund sites are polluted locations within the US that require long-term cleanup. Now, Major General Smedley Butler is, is someone who's familiar to most Veterans for Peace members. Um, he died in 1940. Uh, and at that time, he was the US Marine Corps most decorated soldier. He fought in many, many wars, revolutions and battles. He saw action in the Philippines, China, Central America, the Caribbean and France. After his 34 year career, he became an outspoken critic though of America's corporate wars. His book, which is a really quick read, it's a thin book, it's called War is a Racket. Still very relevant reading. I recommend it to you. Now, recently, when we look at the wars or excursions, or, you know, I don't think that we've really declared war in quite a while. But anyway, uh, Operation Iraqi, well, it was going to be called Operation Iraqi Liberation until somebody looked at those initials and said, maybe that's not such a smart thing to do. And they changed it to Operation Iraqi Freedom. But the, the point I want to make here is that uh, we had nearly 200 to 250,000 troops either on the ground or supporting in other countries to wage that war that required extensive supply lines with a huge carbon boot print and resulted in tremendous environmental devastation. And according to the former U.S. Central Command General John Abizade, he said, of course, it's all about oil. We can't really deny that. Well, with the US finally ending 20 plus years of war in Afghanistan, you'd think that we would see a peace dividend of sorts, but it seems almost immediately we're starting to hear increased noise directed at China and Russia. We see war games, excuse me, we see war games in the Pacific Ocean near the Philippines with US, British and Australian warships. Again, tremendously long supply lines. While in Europe, NATO has virtually surrounded Russia with a ring of ballistic missiles and war games are routinely set up in both of these areas, requiring tremendous amounts of fuel and emit huge greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, as an example, in looking at the 750 or so bases throughout the world, and this is from David Vine's book, Base Nation, we see clusters of bases within the Mideast, in Asia, near the US, 750 bases in over 80 countries. Uh, Russia has maybe at the most 15 to 17. China has one or two. But these our bases, US's bases range in size from the smallest lily pads 
that typically provide pre-positioned weaponry and supplies to huge complexes, including housing, hospitals, bowling alleys, golf courses, and their own power plants. They're virtually self-sufficient. But the overwhelming burden of both of these existential threats falls upon people of color, the poor, and future generations. Civilian war deaths constitute the majority of casualties caused by war, and we're seeing an increasing number of climate refugees created by prolonged droughts, torrential rainfall, persistent wildfires, causing crop failures and putting pressure on people to flee their home countries to what they think is a better life. In fact, on our southern border, we see the border wall reinforced to inhibit refugees from streaming north from Central and South America. Of course, the causes are complex, but climate damage to crops and water supplies are increasing factors. One investigative journalist, Christian Perenni, looked at the US government's attitude about climate change, particularly at, at the Pentagon. And the Pentagon looks at climate change as a threat multiplier. And in fact, is quietly preparing to take charge of a planet shaken by climate chaos. He calls it the politics of the armed lifeboat. Even within the US, we're seeing climate change effects. The map on your left, the photos on your left uh, show the progression of the drying out of California from 2002 through 2014. Uh, I'm sure there were low lying areas in Florida that are going in the opposite direction. Um, we know that the prolonged and devastating effects of the drought in Syria were a major factor during their prolonged civil war, creating millions of refugees who, fl who fled their homeland to nearby Middle Eastern countries and Europe. In fact, due to recent floods and wild, widespread wildfires in the US, we're beginning to see climate migration in this country. Now, social scientists are looking at quantifying and measuring in dollars the impact of greenhouse gas emissions. And they've come up with a concept called the social cost of carbon to bring it down to a human level. And it takes it to day-to-day -to -day household budget impacts, including costs of food, pressure on utility bills, gas, electric bills. It looks at property damage from climate related storms that results in dislocation, increased insurance costs, rising rents, housing, scare, housing scarcity, leads to disrupted supply lines and higher consumer prices. You know, in this country, uh, we may see those as inconveniences. For others, it's the difference between life and death. These pictures depict some of that. Now, our final focus looks at how our tax dollars are spent. And more than 50% of the federal discretionary budget, which is, is a, a number that does not include Social Security and Medicare, over half of that discretionary budget is spent on the US military wars and war preparation. So let's take a look at how those monies are being spent, what it's being spent for. Uh, first, as a comparison, 
and this is a little bit outdated. It's from April of 2020. But at that point in time, the US military budget was actually 10 times more than the combined budgets, excuse me, more than the combined budgets of the next 10 countries. So the US at 730 billion was larger than the aggr aggregate amounts of these next 10 countries combined. In fact, over the last 21 years, over $21 trillion has been spent on foreign and domestic militarization since 9-11. $16 trillion of that went to the military, including over $7 trillion for military contractors. Another $3 trillion went to veterans programs, nearly a trillion went to Homeland Security. How could we spend that money differently? Well, if a commitment would have been made to shifting our national power grid, we could have used some of that money that was spent on war to completely switch to 100% renewable energy. Instead of funding endless wars, we could have transformed our energy system or we could have erased student debt. We could have guaranteed free preschool. You get the picture. You could have, we could have provided COVID vaccines for the population of low income countries. So we've recently had a change in political power in Washington, DC and looking at President Biden's proposed budget for fiscal year 2022, um, his proposed budget for the military was $765 billion, which was more than Trump asked for, which was more than the Pentagon asked for in its budget request. But not to be outdone, the Congressional Committee added another $24 billion to the military's projected budget. This was from a democratically, a Democrat controlled subcommittee. So politicians from both major parties routinely support approving the National Defense Authorization Act with very little discussion. And I know this is kind of a busy slide. I want you to just focus on the big blue portion. That's the military. So it's half of the discretionary budget. But wait, as they say, it's even more than that because items that you would suspect should be associated with this spending amount are in other categories. For example, nuclear weapons seemingly in my mind though that probably belongs with the military but as a budget line item in in the united states budget it's over in energy and environment veterans benefits they're a separate line item as well so if you look at this and add up all of these contributors it's over 1.25 trillion dollars and um Everything in the federal government is subject to an audit. Well, the Pentagon resisted being audited for a number of years. And I think it was four years ago, they underwent their first audit and they failed that audit. Well, they've undergone two additional audits. And as one would predict, they failed those audits as well. So not only do they get a lot of money? They can't account for how they spend that money. So maybe we could do something differently with that money. So I know I've provided you with a stunning amount of facts and information. Uh, the point I want to make 
is that we can no longer ignore the military in how it contributes to the climate crisis. The specifics can be discussed and investigated later, but uh, we think that this is a subject that should be discussed. We're not advocating that we get rid of the military, but we want them to be responsible in their contribution to the climate crisis, and we want them to be responsible in how they spend our tax dollars. Our project, we've set up what we feel is a very robust website. Uh, I think that Janet is going to drop the the link in the chat room, veteransforpeace.org. Uh, we have resources there that you can find. We've got a section on keeping up with Climate Envoy Kerry. Um, several months ago, we had an audience with John Kerry's uh, assistants from his staff to discuss these issues of transparency of military emissions and reporting. Uh, we felt it was a fruitful meeting, uh, but we've heard nothing since then. We've done a number of these slideshow presentations. In fact, we're, I think we're up to 30 now, and the majority of them have been with uh, climate organizations, which is encouraging to me because we're reaching out beyond uh, Veterans for Peace and World Beyond War. But we've been most successful in negotiating with representative, California Representative Barbara Lee and her staff. We wrote a House resolution to demand that the Pentagon accurately and transparently report all emissions, both domestic and international, uh, to Congress. And Barbara Lee has consented to be the lead sponsor. She's introduced it into the House. It's called House Resolution 767. And we have, I think, 31 co-sponsors now. And in a minute, we'll drop a link in the chat on how you can urge your own specific congressperson how to support this House resolution. That's something that you can do. You can connect militarism to the climate crisis when you have conversations. You can certainly use all the tools and materials on our website, as well as World Beyond Wars websites. Um, don't let politicians off the hook. Both political parties routinely increase Pentagon spending. It's our money, it's our air. Uh, we get to have a voice. We need to amplify our voices. We also ask that you find us opportunities to present this slideshow. Do you know of a climate group? a political group, a progressive democratic caucus, a church group, concerned neighbors. Uh, you know, with the advent of uh, an all volunteer military, uh, the actual impact of the military aside from the media produced propaganda uh, is has been minimized. So we really don't have that much direct contact to what it really does and how it spends its money and, and how the contractors take such a big piece out of it. So go to our website, the Climate Crisis and Militarism Project. You can schedule a presentation. You can support the congressional resolution and you can view our resources such as a printable brochure that encapsulates the majority of this slideshow. We also have some bumper stickers available that you can get through the website. Now, I thank you for your time. Uh, we are stronger together. Uh, we have to get out of our silos and communicate. Uh, it seems to me that in Veterans for Peace, particularly, uh, 
uh, we're an aging population. And this is a topic that we can reach out to youthful groups that are engaged in climate activism and have some commonality and share this education. I look forward to our discussion and I thank you for your attention. Shall we have some questions or comments? Yes, and, and uh, thank you very much, Gary and, and Larry. And uh, just a reminder, folks are, are all muted. So if you want to ask a question, I'd ask you to use that raise hand feature or uh, somehow visibly, <laughs> physically raise your hand and we will unmute you so you can ask the question and engage in some conversation. Barb? And I see Barb. Uh, yes, uh, just prior to the war in Iraq, shortly after 9-11, George Herbert Walker Bush told his son GW not to start the draft or you'll have another Vietnam on your hands. So they started an all volunteer army and a mercenary army run by Eric Prince and the Vandos woman who runs Amway her parents own Amway, and they took control pretty much of the mercenary army and the all volunteer army, and they got mega bucks, these military people, especially the mercenary army. And they are hired out by other countries like Chile and that, these, this army of ours is hired out. It's incredible. It's all in this book, Black Water by uh, Jeremy Shahill. Uh, who was with writer for Nation Magazine. It's incredible. I can hardly uh, read more than a chapter at a time. When you read those resources are incredible that they're spending, incredible. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. And those are our tax dollars that are being spent for political ends. And it also though, by having a mercenary or volunteer army, it removes that direct impact on American families of what the experience of war is really like. And, uh, you know, it seems like it's been, the military budget has been flying under the radar, but we are spending uh, a ton of our tax dollars that could be better spent on projects that benefit us citizens in this country and the world, as far as that goes, rather than um, how it's being spent. But that's a great example, Barb, of uh, how our society has changed since the war on, terror, uh, war on terror has started. Fred? Fred, yes. Uh, yeah, Gary, thank you so much for the presentation. I take it that uh, this is pretty much the presentation that uh, is offered through the um, um, climate change and militarism site. Uh, they do mention um, that uh, presentations are uh, available. Exactly. And, you know, I, I'd like to say that we, we can tailor this presentation if you have uh, a particular group that you have in mind. What I have found in, in our experience of doing this presentation uh, you know, this was sponsored by Veterans for Peace and World Beyond War. And so there may be a little bit of emphasis on the beyond war component of it. I know that when I approach a mainstream climate activist group that uh, I will emphasize things a little bit differently. Uh, we want to look at getting a large proportion of the population talking about this. We don't expect climate groups to drop everything and have this as their lead topic, but they can no longer ignore the military's outsized contribution to the climate crisis. But yes, Fred, th this is a direct result of that climate crisis and militarism project. Yeah, so I have a, a second question. I mean, especially since you are also active with 350.org in San Diego, 
Um, can you, what, what are your ideas about how uh, your project and climate groups like 350.org can collaborate on this issue? That's a great question because as I said at the start, most of, well, at least in San Diego, from my direct experience, they have, you know, in any volunteer organization, everybody has a great idea on what to pursue. And then when it comes time to who's going to do it, you, you see the same number of people doing it. Well, limited bandwidth would be another way to put it. We've collaborated with San Diego 350.org. Uh, we started uh, with a campaign against the Miramar Air Show, and they signed on and they were a co sponsor with us. And we did bannering together with members of 350, San Diego 350.org. Uh, we are now engaged in a campaign. Uh, looking at the PFAS situation within San Diego. So it's, you know, it's finding opportunities within your local climate group and where their interests lie and where you can have some commonality. So it's, you know, it's, it's very specific to your organization. If you want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation um, about the Bay Area, we can do that after this talk. I, uh, I, I raised my hand. So I, I have a question or a comment for you, Gary. Uh, th first of all, thanks very much for the presentation. And much of it obviously is focused on, you know, carbon emissions and the, the waste of, you know, and fossil fuels and so on to that's destroying our, our world. Um, I think we also though need to keep in mind that when we when we go to war, the effects of those wars last forever. Uh, one example for, uh, is that uh, landmines. Uh, there are supposedly 110 million landmines around the world in 90 countries, and the United Nations has estimated that it will take 1,100 years to uh, take care of all of those landmines. Uh, we know that from World War II, there are, there are cities in, in Europe still that are, are, you know, have to be careful because of unexploded ordinances that you, you mentioned. And certainly that's true in Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos as well. Um, my point, I guess, is yes, the, the war is devastating in terms of climate change and its contribution to, to climate change, but war also endangers human beings for a long period of time after suppose, yeah, there's somebody who just mentioned Agent Orange. Um, and, uh, you know, all of those things, the, the impact of war goes on for decades and centuries, so. Well, I'll, thank you, Al, that's absolutely true. And um, uh, I'll add a local one to you. Uh, we live in a suburb of San Diego and we raised our kids in a suburb of San Diego, but adjacent to our suburb, was a land that used to be an army base called Camp Elliott. And, uh, you know, they didn't do a good job of cleaning up the gunnery range from World War I and World War II. They put a fence around it with some signs, do not trespass. Well, of course, uh, unfortunately, a couple of uh, eight and 10 year olds were wandering around and ended up finding unexploded ordinance and, and were killed, even within a major city like San Diego. And, you know, one of our members had conversations with one of the leaders in, in Camp Pendleton, the Marine base that's north of us. And they, the Marine was laughing. He said, you know, they'll never, they'll never reclaim and redevelop this land because it is so polluted from what the military has done and not cleaned up after itself. So it, yeah, it's not just during war. And another thing in the aftermath of war and the rebuilding of it, when they use concrete, when they use cement, that also produces tremendous amounts of greenhouse gases. Agree. Thank you. Uh, Joe? Joe Hi. Bergson? Yeah, hi. I just wanted to um, uh, appreciate the the 
uh, budget item uh, of nuclear weapons not even being in the military budget, at least half of their cost, and and wonder about the role of nuclear weapons, um, you know, in our not our um, dominant position in the world. And um, that's what I'm working on now is to try to change our policy, but uh, Biden does not seem to be on the same page as, uh, as me. Anyway, um, thanks for that nod. And do um, you have any comment further on nuclear weapons and our- Well, no, I did, you know, there, there are, and you're probably involved in this in, in uh, instances at the local level local level to get local municipalities to adopt a, a no first strike uh, right. issue you want to talk about that a little bit I think that's worth uh, uh, vocalizing and, and putting out in front of us right we're so there's the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons which was passed by uh, you know, over 50 states and ratified by over 50 states in the United Nations. And, and there, one way to support that notion is to get your city uh, in a city's appeal uh, to, to endorse that. And uh, that just builds momentum for pushing the Biden administration to start where they're, they're in the middle of a nuclear posture review right now. They're, they're working on their policy for the Biden administration. Uh, and so we've been trying to, at uh, Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility, have been trying to influence that process, but it's so opaque and within the defense department that it, it's really hard to get in there. But, but cities appeals, you know, the more, the more we hear about it, the better. But thanks for listening to me. Do you, do you have a, a website or something you want to drop in the chat? Uh, WPSR.org. And I think there's somebody here from Oregon <laughs> to PSR as well. So there's a few chapters around that are working on this. Well, great. We appreciate your work. Thank you. Uh, Renee? A couple of comments. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. I'm, I'm a distance from the microphone. Uh, first, I did appreciate this. Um, Physicians for Social Responsibility has been aware of and working on this project for a long time. One of the things that I got involved in is that the government and the military allows exceptions for disposal of their toxic materials. And in Oregon, what they did or what we found was that after the Vietnam War, after it became illegal to spray Agent Orange in Vietnam, the government said, well, it's okay to use it domestically. And so until 1986, it was used on the Oregon coast. And we saw deformed children, just like they had in Vietnam. We also have in Eastern Oregon, nerve gas, which they're trying to dispose of in various ways, some of which are, are very toxic. And the program that we put on back in the 80s was called uh, the health effects of war. And the major health effects come from the effects on the environment. And so that these are very, very closely related. And I would hope in your further presentations, you talk a little bit about the health effects because they're, they're really dramatic. Anyway, thank you. Was, was that a presentation that you did or do you have some documentation you could send me? The, uh, unfortunately, we lost the original presentation. We presented it for about eight years and someone tried to put it together again and it's, it's never come up to the level of a presentation again. So we're working, we're okay. still working on it. And eventually we'll try and do that. We presented it all over Oregon to the uh, Oregon Health Science Center, the medical school, the veterans, you know, all the hospitals, everybody had presentations of it. And we also did local church groups and stuff. It, it's a very effective program um, to talk about that. So yeah, I really appreciate and also, I, I have friends who work at Oak Ridge, 
they're the kind that uh, throw sand in the works. And they've worked <laughs> there for 20 some years and invited me to go as an Oak Ridge representative to the Physiome Project. And while we were there, I asked them if they could uncover the tonnage of bombs that were either manufactured or dropped by the military. And they spent a year looking for that information. It's just buried. It, it just can't be found. And so w there's a huge amount of damage that's being done permanently, like you talked about. And I wish I had that presentation. I, my old computer's gone, and it was on that. But maybe we'll try and recreate it. If you could give some impetus to that, that would be great. <laughs> You're muted, Al. Sorry, uh, Reverend Swartz, uh, yes. James Swartz. Uh, yeah, thanks, Larry. Uh, Gary, uh, you you brought up about the Agent Orange. When I was in Vietnam uh, four years ago, the uh, group of us that were there, the one thing we discovered was, that, for instance, at Da Nang, the United States government had made a commitment to neutralize uh, major areas of Agent Orange, and they had spent uh, several million dollars in Da Nang uh, uh, plowing up and then covering and uh, neutralizing uh, a huge area of Agent Orange at a cost of over a million dollars. And then they discovered the only thing when they got it neutralized, all they could use the soil for was to uh, as a base base for the expanded air base. But then we had the maps and the United States government had made commitments to uh, for US aid to uh, continue with many areas. And we've never followed through with that. The uh, uh, Obama administration and the, then the Trump administration withheld the additional monies to start neutralizing many of these areas. And the uh, same with the unexploded ordinance. Uh, uh, we, we observed a, a uh, uncovering of a 500 pound bomb uh, in an area where they were starting to build a soccer field. And we watched the uh, UN team uh, blow it up that day. And then we heard another explosion later in the day. They, they said they have, you know, every day, one more uncovered ordinance in Cambodia, when I was there about 10 years ago, I observed uh, all these men who are disabled because they worked in the fields and ended up being uh, uh, handicapped from landmines that are in unexploded ordnance. So we've got, you know, this is a major issue that uh, is, that needs a lot more cover because it is an environmental, we, we've left, throughout the whole world uh, are deadly uh, issues. You didn't include the, uh, uh, the uh, depleted uranium, uh, which I think it, it would be, yeah. should be added to your list uh, uh, in there too. So, but I mean, these, I'm, I'm glad you're bringing this up. Uh, last night at our chapter meeting, we voted to ask, uh, someone from the CCMP uh, to give us talk next uh, either in January or February. Uh, uh, Jack Spewer, who should have been on that meeting, uh, I will get back and hold in touch with him. He's, he's already sent me the request. Oh, good. You're chapter 23, right? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Good. Yeah, you know, you're, you're, you're illustrating the point that if if the U.S. military were your neighbor, uh, you wouldn't want him next door to you. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Gary. It's an excellent presentation. We look forward to uh, your presenting to our chapter, and we'll try to get some of our uh, civilian, our civilian uh, environmental groups to join in at that time. Well, that's, ex that's exactly what we want to see happen. Uh, you know, in fact, I challenge each of you can you find one opportunity for us? Uh, Larry and Al and I were talking before we opened up the Zoom room here, and I said, well, I don't, 
you know, I don't care how many people come as long as it's more than just us three, that if we can get at least one other opportunity, one other group, church group, environmental group, uh, peace group, neighborhood group, I don't care, political group, if we can get, this is a grassroots organization. This is a grassroots effort. If we could get one more, I'd consider this a, a huge success. So I, I'm challenging you guys. We're going to accept the challenge. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Um, Robert? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm very glad you brought this up. My father was the commander of the National Guard in Kentucky in Bluegrass Ordnance Depot when I was in high school. And we lived on the edge of the depot. And I used to play over these little mounds that were behind the fence of our house. It was common for me to sun myself and read lying against the mound. Well, only two years ago, I read that they were chemical oh. depositories for toxics. And I was lying on them. And they were finally being decommissioned because the barrels were beginning to leak. My father told me when I was your, you, when you and I were together, I suspect at the same age, and I was facing being drafted for Vietnam, I went to see him, Major Sullivan, and I said, you went to Europe. I don't know what to do because I still believed at the time that my government would tell me the truth. I was very naive. I had not read General Smedley Butler. And my father said, I don't know why you should be in Vietnam. Now, that was good in the sense that I didn't go to the military, but it was bad in the sense that I did not have the chance to achieve your clarity. And I really appreciate your clarity today. It's an astonishing clarity. And I promise to you that I will make the largest combination of people I can here in New Orleans. And when we are ready, I would like to invite you to make this presentation to them. Thank, Thank you, sir. you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Diane? Hi. Um, this I think if this might be for Renee, but it's for anybody. I didn't know Agent Orange was used at all in the United States. And since it defoliates everything, why would anybody use it here? That's my question. Well, the, it was used to make profits for the timber companies. The long and the short of it is based on a theoretical paper that was put out. For every acre that they sprayed, they got to overcut the sustainable yield in the national forest by hundreds of thousands of board feet. And so it was tremendously profitable. For $80, they could spray an acre of uh, timberland that had already been cut in here in Oregon. And since we drink surface water at the coast, all of that focused down into our water. And that's what we drank. And the first anencephalic baby I delivered, and then I talked to the other doctors. I'm in a town of 4,000. There were two others. That's three anencephalic babies, babies with no brain. These, you know, that it was just unconscionable. And it was only until this year when that documentary came out that I realized that they were still spraying Agent Orange. I thought they were spraying other defoliants. I didn't realize that until 86, they could still spray Agent Orange. So yeah, that's why. It's money, it's greed. It's always about greed. Other questions, comments, or? I, I, see, I see two questions in the chat, one from Arthur Hebert. How does your organization hold politicians and industries accountable? That's a really good question because uh, we have a, we're a voluntary 
we're a volunteer organization. Our, our, our budget, we rely on donations. You know, I could have a tin cup here. And I'm talking about, you know, what did I say? It was $1.25 trillion. So they kind of outspend us. But, um, you know, I'm an optimist. And I feel that even communicating like this, we get to have a voice in this too. And unless we discuss all of these aspects, something, I mean, not everybody is concerned about each topic that I brought up today, but we have separate concerns. And if we can amalgamate our concerns to shed the light, to, to shine the light on how the military, as the title of this talk said, has gotten a free pass on pollution and a free pass on spending, we can put a stop to it because we're, we're strong when we're together and they like to keep us isolated. So uh, we continue to spread the word. I mean, I, I'm heartened to see how many of you turned out and how many people have entered into the discussion here. There's more than just you and you and you and me who feel this way. And so uh, we have to continue to support each other with, a, with an eye on the goal. So that's how we put pressure on people. And I guess an example would be the initial starting thing that we have. I mean, Barbara Lee has worked with us on providing relief for Agent Orange victims for years. That, that bill is introduced each year. And we're also looking at transparency in military emissions. And more and more climate organizations are starting to talk about it. So we're seeing some progress. So we can't get disheartened. Um, we have to continue to talk about it. Now, another question, is there a minimal US military footprint that would be acceptable? Well, personally, uh, I would like to see it at zero, but I don't think that that's realistic in today's world. So I'm not gonna give up because that's my deepest belief. I feel that we do have to put pressure on it to shrink though. And we can only do that by discussing these topics. And so I want it to go the other way rather than see it balloon out with, with no end in sight and even, not even a discussion about how they're spending our tax dollars. The, uh, the, another comment I want to make, Gary, you, you mentioned this uh, calling out people and, and asking for activists and so on. Um, it's encouraging to me when I talk with young people um, and it's organizations like climate, you know, 350 and, but I'm also thinking of extent X. What is it called? Extinction, Extinction Rebellion. Rebellion. Yeah. XR, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a whole bunch of young people. Uh, and I don't mean that exclusively, but you've got young people who are concerned because it's their world that uh, they're worried about. Um, and I think there is a way for Veterans for Peace and, and World Beyond War and other groups concerned about the environment to link up with, with uh, Extinction Rebellion and other organizations that are legitimately concerned about the future of this world. Absolutely right. I think uh, Diane still has her hand up. Uh, Diane? Diane, if you if you go to the uh, reactions, you can if you if you're on a PC, you can lower your hand. If, unless unless you have a question, do you have a? <laughs> I, uh, Janet. Janet, I, oh, let me ask you get you to unmute. There. Yeah, thanks. Um, 
I, I wanted to chime in on that last point. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm also with Climate Crisis and Militarism and work closely with Gary, who, as you can imagine, is wonderful to work with. Um, I am also very active in my local group in Portland, Oregon, Extinction Rebellion PDX. And um, I and another woman helped get Extinction Rebellion as a national network to endorse uh, what is now House Resolution 767. Uh, we had to show, we Climate Crisis and Militarism Project had to demonstrate to Barbara Lee and her staff that there was adequate support, especially from environmental and climate groups for her to spend some of her political capital and put that resolution forward and push it with her colleagues. So I'm proud to say that Extinction Rebellion as a national network um, did you know, jump on that. Also Food and Water Watch and uh, Greenpeace USA or some of the other kind of big names in climate and environmental activism that we were proud to get their support right away. Um, also my local group here in Portland saw the very first iteration of this slideshow, <coughs> excuse me, last March and we had a great discussion. Um, what I'm finding as I discuss this with people I know uh, that especially younger people, uh, unfortunately are, are ignorant of the history of the Vietnam War, for example, and they're ignorant of the, um, well, <laughs> of the tremendous impacts of, uh, of militarism and US militarism specifically on the climate crisis. Now, of course, it's not only US militarism. It's the military, you know, especially the large militaries of the world, many of whom the US sells weapons and weapon systems to that also contribute. Sunrise Movement as a national organization, I have to say is, and, uh, the Sierra Club have been very cowardly on this so far. This is another sort of avenue that if you're a long-term supporter as I have been of major environmental mainstream organizations, you know, send a message, um, let them know that this needs to be part of their messaging and that they can no longer pretend that the United States is not a major military power and that that doesn't drive a lot of our national emissions because it does. Janet, uh, I certainly want to thank you for all your postings here in the chat. Uh, you, you were just right on, right after he uh, Gary would mention something, you were putting the links. So we want to thank you for that. I. Uh, also want to add, uh, one of the things I'm starting to see, and Gary, it, it, maybe there's some glimmer of hope sometimes. Now when we, I see a uh, military flyover at you know, even college sporting events, um, and I'm sitting in a room, I'm starting to have, I'm, there are people in the room who say, what are we doing with that? What does that have to do with college football? or with a, you know, any kind of sporting event. It, and, and we know that it goes back to a link between uh, military recruitment and, and uh, the NFL, and then probably with the NCAA. But start, we're starting to get people to say, really, do we need to burn jet fuel before we can have a college football game? So that's encouraging. Well, and that's, that's the whole concept of the free pass that the military has gotten. And it, they, it, it, if you object or criticize that visual display of military power, they'll instantly brand you as um, a lot of different names. Uh, when we started to protest the Miramar Air Show, we, there's a there's a freeway overpass nearby. And we typically start out, say, four weekends before, and we have this, these huge banners. And we would say, uh, stop endless war. 
and people would honk, give us the peace sign, wave to us, and you know that was all fine and good. And as we got closer to the air show, um, we changed our 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 banner to air show fuels climate crisis. And suddenly, some of the people forgot what the peace sign was. They only gave us half of it. And so it, it's, it, it's a matter th that even if you criticize it, they want to brand you as being anti-patriotic. And that's not true. So we have to discuss these things. And just because we want to shine the light of day on it doesn't mean that we're saying, let's get rid of all of this right away. What are we going to do? It's let's look at it let's be responsible, especially in the area of pollution. And yes, Gustavo, the military still does recruiting in high schools. In fact, there's a, there's a subsection of Veterans for Peace called Gamers for Peace right now, which is very active in that environment, in that space about doing anti-recruiting in the gaming area and and often as i understand it in quite a few states parents of high school students need to opt out if they don't want military recruiters to have access to their kids right so it's 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 assumed that military recruiters can can be in the cafeterias and talk to kids um, unless the parent objects on the other hand you know college recruiters aren't free to you know visit with kids in a in the college in the high school cafeterias Robert did you have a question no thank you I'm still thinking about all of the things I've heard today I want to thank you again Well, I want to thank each of you for your activism and your attendance here. And I'm throwing that challenge out on the table. Find us another spot to do this. Okay. And then when COVID is really over, we're going to do a grand tour and we'll have a beer. Wow. <laughs> a, a grand tour in what electric vehicles or solar powered vehicles huh a volkswagen yes the, yeah the id buzz yeah thank you all or, or trains well, we, well gary uh we want to thank you for your excellent presentation and i think you've uh stimulated a lot of thought here and uh we will uh live up to your challenge and uh, get your presentation out to more organizations uh, going forward. So uh, unless Al or Gary has anything else, uh, I think it's worth uh, a good solid uh, round of applause.